Oh, thank you all. Every time you stand up, you're so, please be seated. I just, uh, it's great to be here. I, uh, my, I didn't, I've got some water here. I did not soil myself in a weird place. Uh, I, my water bottle leaked. But, of course, with this dry mountain air, or dry desert air, you know what's going to happen. It'll be dry in a very short time. So I'm not too concerned. Um, Time's sake, let's open up to Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to, even though there's some who are here for the first time, uh, like, uh, you know, I've been here Friday and twice on Saturday and, and everything, so I'm going to pick up a little bit. But before I share, when the Lord appeared to me and taught me, you know, how the Father communicates to us, there were some things that were just made clear that to share a little bit more about Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. So in Hebrews chapter 1, it says this, God, it, I'm using the King James Version because Paul used it. <clears throat> Actually, I use, I, thank you for those who caught that. I mean, that's an old joke, so it's, it's old as the hills, but still. Um, but most of the old uh, study books are geared towards the King James or the Revised. So I just, I do the John Finn paraphrase. I just take out the these and thous and, and everything. But I will read this here in Hebrews chapter one. It says, God, who in many ways, modern translation, many ways and in many parts, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, one of the things when I was praying this morning to understand, many, many people have issues with the God of the Old Testament. And so they're raised thinking, Jesus I love, but the Father, is he the guy in heaven with a baseball bat ready to beam me over the head? Because he just seems so angry in the Old Testament. I mean, there are examples there that we don't understand. And we go back 34, 3,500 years and try to understand a culture that we have nothing in common with in, in a, a part of the world that is more ancient than that. And then we apply our standards to it and we say, God looks so unjust. And even though Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, especially verses 7 through 11, he says the things that happened to Israel happened to us as, for examples to us. Excuse me, he said the, the things that happened to Israel happened as examples for us. So we look at some of the things and I'm sure any parent here, if you've ever made an example of one of your kids, you know, laying down the law, you know how it is, I'm the oldest of four. I don't know about you, but when my, by the time my little brothers and my sister came along, I asked my mom, how do you let them get away with that? I got a paddle on the rear end for that and you're just giving them a mild rebuke and, <laughs> you know, I was the example. So we can understand this to a degree that the things that happen in the Old Testament, it says God spoke in many ways and many parts to the fathers in the Old Testament. But in these last days, verse two says, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed over all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So that means the highest and best revelation of the Father God is the Lord Jesus. Stop looking to the Old Testament for a revelation uh, in these ways and parts and getting confused saying, how can, the, how can God be one way and Jesus another? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Understand there's a progression of revelation and it says that in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That's why in John 14, when Philip says to Jesus, hey, just show us the father and that's enough for us. And, and Jesus said in verses nine, he said, he said, have I been such a long time with you, Philip? You don't know. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. That seems to be in contrast with the Old Testament because it is. Because the Old Testament was not as great a revelation as it is when Jesus came into this earth Amen. as God's word for mankind. You understand? Yes. So I hope that helps. And that is the purpose that was specifically in prayer for those who have difficulty with the, the God of the Old Testament. You're not going to understand everything this side of heaven. You just, just settle it. You, we don't understand. How, how, the Lord had a man executed for, for gathering firewood on the Sabbath. 
And you look at it, you say, that was right after he gave the word and he was using that guy as an example. Now he was a believer in the God of Israel. He's in heaven, I'm sure. Praise God for that. But that was an example. That seems pretty harsh. I don't understand it all. God spoke in many ways and many parts to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. How about this son? What about him? In verse three, he is the brightness of the father's glory. Stop and think about that sentence structure. The subject matter is still the Father God, and he's talking about his Son, who is the brightness of his, the Father's glory. The brightness. Think about that. He's the bright. He's the light part of the Father's glory. And it says he is the express image of his person. That is a printer's term. It's used in the old, old ways when they would have a, a seal, a clay seal, and they would stamp a hot wax to seal a scroll or a document. It is, it, and, and when you do that, the impressed image, it's actually in the Greek, it's impressed image. You know, you take something and you press it down and there is the exact image transferred. And that's what it says, this is who the son is. In these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, who is the express image, the very nature of the father. That's why Jesus could say, Philip, I've been such a long time with you. Don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Old Testament revelations, I've traced that in earlier session. I showed Christ in the Old Testament all the way through. But it was in many ways and many parts, and then that word became flesh. Now, every one of us would say there's power in the word, right? I want you to see verse, the end of verse 3, and I want to put this in proper New Testament reality. He's still talking about the Father and Jesus. That is, Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his person, the Father's person. He upholds all things by the word of his, the Father's power. Okay, stop and think about that. That's not the power of the word. Jesus upholds all things by the word of his, the Father's power. It's the Father who has the power. But he expresses himself through the person of his son, Jesus. The Father has the power. Jesus is the expression, the word of that power. Very practical illustration. Let's imagine a dad in a recliner sitting at home, and he's got a teenage son. Son, the car needs washed. Would you go do it? The son goes to wash the car. Now, the Father is the power, but the Son is the expression of that word, that wish, that desire to go wash the car. So it is the Son is the word of the Father's power. He is the word of the Father. But the Father is the one who said, we need to wash the car. Go wash the car. So the Son proceeds from the father, and he starts to wash the car. So you could accurately say, did the father wash the car? You could say, yeah, the father's the source of it. He's the source. He's the one who ordained for that car to be washed. He is the source of it. And you could say, but, but did the son wash the car? Well, yes, the son washed the car. He's the one who actually did it. But here's the trick. It was the water that actually washed the car. That's the Holy Spirit. So then you'd say, son, did you wash the car? Yes. But you know what? If I'm in science class, I'm going to say, no, you didn't. It was the water that washed the car. So you see the word and the spirit, the, the son and the water, the, the word and the spirit work together. And it is the spirit which gives life. John chapter 6, verse 61, I believe it is. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So proceeding from the Father, the Son washes the car, but it's actually the water that does it. As the Son and the water work together, the, the Word and the Spirit work together. You could have that Son out there by the car all you want, but that car is not getting washed. It's not until the water happens that the Son and the water work together, the Word and the Spirit. That's why the name of Jesus can be a curse word and there's no power attached to it. The name of Jesus is not a magic word. It's not a talisman. But if you put the Father 
with his intent, with his emotion, with his will. Father, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If he does that and he empowers the son as the head of the body of Christ to do something and he sends his spirit, then the word and the spirit work together and it gets done. That's where you and I come in. That's where you and I come in. The name of Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe, but it's nothing unless the Holy Spirit accompanies it. Now I realize, you know, you're, you're praying over your food. You're not gonna stop and say, oh, Father, bless this Twinkie. Can you do that? I don't know if there's anything good in there. Maybe I shouldn't say Twinkie. Let's just say yellow cake. And the father's like, hey, I, you know, I can't do much with that, but I'll bless your fellowship. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there are times you don't have time to say, okay, now is the Holy Spirit in this or not? You're just gonna say, Father, bless this food. Thank you in the name of Jesus, amen, go on. But understand the principle that I'm sharing. Somebody needs prayer or you're praying for somebody. Here's, here's how it works in real life. Have you ever had a situation, well, with myself, years ago, I had a friend cross my mind several times in a week just come up to my mind, just kind of flowed over. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what's going on with so-and-so. About two weeks later, that person contacted me. And I said, yeah, you've been on my heart. I've been thinking about you. And they said, oh, thank you for praying. Because the last two weeks have been really hard. Thank you so much. And then I'm, this, honestly, I said, Father, oh, I realized that was you now suggesting that I pray for them. So I don't know if prayers can be retroactive, but I pray two weeks ago. I pray now for two weeks ago when they first came on my heart. Can you make that effective? I honestly did that. And then I learned that friend that I haven't heard from in a while, that, that they're just on my heart. They just float across my mind. Do you ever have that? I don't know why so-and-so is on my mind. Take that as the cue. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the life. That's where the Father wants to go. But you're the body of Christ. You've got his word. You've got the representation of the word here in the earth or the representation of the Father here in the earth. So the Father says, you need to pray for your friend. And he just does it by just floating. They float up in your mind. So just lift a prayer. I pray for so-and-so. And then when they show up two weeks later and say, I had a rough time, and when you say, I've, you've been on my heart for the last two weeks, thank you for praying for me. You can say, honestly, you're welcome. So learn from my mistakes. You pause before somebody. You want to pray with them. You pause before them. Don't just start spouting. Don't start declaring. Don't start using some formula. Stop and say, Father, what's your mind? What's your heart? Where do you want the water? Where's the water going to wash the car? Where's that water flowing? And follow it. The son wants to father. The, fa the son is following the father. And together with the water, that car gets washed. So you don't know what they need, but, but the father will quicken to you what they need by the spirit. Then you can direct the word of God. Oh, Father, they need healing. I pray, 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we were healed. Oh, Father, I sense that they, they're, they're depressed, that they, they need you know, some help. Would you strengthen them by your spirit with might in their inner man? Let them know they're not alone. You follow the leading of the spirit. That's the spirit-filled spirit life, spirit-led life. Mm -mm -mm. So it's not just the power of the word. It is the word. Jesus upholds all things by the word of the Father's power. The Father has the power. And he is the word, the expression of that power. Now let's read that again. God, in many ways, in many parts, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world's. Who, that is that son, is the brightness of the Father's glory. He's the impressed image of his very person, his very character, and he upholds all things by the word of the Father's power. And when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He upholds all things by the word of the Father's power. Didn't Jesus say in John 5, 19, I only do what I see my Father do? 
And in verses 29, 30, he says, as I hear, I judge. How is it we think that faith is something that we can just call and out and say, I'm standing in faith. It's like, get together with the Lord. Find out where he's moving. Find out where the, where the Father, what his will is. Noah didn't just decide to build a boat. He received instruction. He received grace. He received a revelation. His response was faith. Faith it proceeds from a revelation of the Father God. Abraham, I want you to be a mighty nation, but you're going to have to take a long walk to the promised land. Moses, I want you to be the deliverer. You're going to have to return to Egypt. Joshua, you're here before the city of Jericho. I'll tell you how to, how to take it. All of those came by revelation, revelation, revelation. Faith is the response to the revelation. So when we get a bad diagnosis, when we have a bill that needs to be paid, when we do something, don't just start spouting out and declaring and doing all the stuff that the charismatic circles t teach you to do. Stop. Father, where's your wisdom? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says that everything that pertains to life and godliness has already been provided through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. Everything that pertains to my life and godliness, both this life and my ability to grow in you, has already been provided. Father, reveal your will. Where is your will? How should I handle this situation? Get the revelation. Get the grace. Allow Jesus to uphold all things by the word of his power. Let the Father's power be revealed to you on where he's moving. And then respond. I've, I've shared my truck. I, I need to get my truck in to be repaired. And this past couple weeks, I did something just stupid. That is, I left the truck door open because I was getting things in and out of it. And it's just a 20-year-old Ford F-150, okay? It's just, but I like it. It's my truck. <laughs> it's got some bumps and bangs, but it's, I've replaced the motor at 95,000 miles, and it's got another 70 on top of that. But it's my truck. Seat covers, because the original seats are torn and all. I left the door open, and then I ran the lawnmower. I was backing up, and then I ran the lawnmower right by it, and it caught the edge and just bent the driver's side door just out. So what's involved is me sitting in the truck holding the door closed because it, it'll only close within 10 or 12 inches, driving down the road pretending to be like a Jeep with its doors off or something because I'm holding it like here and I'm driving with one hand and I have to find a time where Barb will follow me in and not be too embarrassed at her husband who, you know, broke his truck. I'm going, Father, when's a good time for this? We've got so many things going on, but it's a 30-minute drive in, a 30-minute drive out. I need the worker, I need, I need the, the owner of the shop there just to, to look at it, to make sure that what we can do to form the estimate, because he does his own estimates, all the different stuff. I need all this timing. When is it? And I work through it in my mind. And I pray about it. It's like door number one, door number two, door number three, and I pray about it. And I walk down mentally as I'm praying in tongues, as I'm just praying, and I'm kind of walking through what would be required. Okay, I'm going to take a rope from one door to the other. I'm going to pull it tight across my lap. Well, if I get in a wreck, they'll have to cut me out. You know, and all these things are going through, but I'm saying, where is the peace? It's like, okay, that's a good process. I have a peace about that. Do, do we go on, on Monday? You know, do we go on Tuesday? What day? And it felt right to go on, I think it was Tuesday. Or maybe, no, maybe it was Wednesday. But anyway, that, day, that felt right. And I said, Barbara, I think this is the timing. What I'm looking for is where is the life? The Father's got the power, so how is he exercising that power to, to get my need met? I didn't want to just drive in there and make it happen. I want to flow. And sure enough, I felt right. I said, let's go at this time. It just feels right. Bears witness in my spirit. That's where the anointing is. Let's go with that. Went in there. The shop owner was there. Came out and gave me the estimate. Said it'd be a couple of weeks. And that's where we sit. There's other things to be done, but I always wait. Okay, everything that, that pertains to life and godliness has been provided already. Our handicapped son who's in a wheelchair, years ago, years ago, when we had the last five of our cattle, taking them into the, stock mar into the market to be sold, we were downsizing. And I loaded Chris into the pickup truck and, and rented a, um, a stock trailer to put the five head of cattle in the back there. For whatever reason, I didn't take Chris's wheelchair. It was 29 miles one direction just to the, to the stock sale. 
we get about 10 miles from the house and the truck quits and just coast over to the side. Oh, Father, where's your provision? This caught me by surprise. And I literally said that. I said, Father, I touched the, the, the steering wheel. I said, Father, I was stupid to not bring that wheelchair. Reveal your provision. Everything that pertains to life and godliness has been provided. Reveal your provision, Father. Just then, a big old Dodge Ram coming the opposite direction, crosses the grassy median, pulls up and says, you guys need something? I explained the situation. He says, well, let's push your truck out of the way. I'll take your, your, your livestock. I'll take it up to the sale. And I, I said, it's, it's like 29, 30 miles one way. He said, that's no problem. Picked up Chris, loaded him in the truck. He took us, dropped off the, the animals, even took me to the car wash so that I could wash out the stock trailer because, you know, five cattle in the back of a trailer going 30 miles, not a pretty sight, not a pretty smell. Washed it out, took it back to where I'd rented that trailer from. Yes, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you can rent a stock trailer. And, and then he took us back to the truck. And I said, Father, I just needed to, there's the shop right there, quarter mile away, just needed to work that, clo- that far. And the guy said, hey, let's see, let's try starting it. Maybe something's cooled down or, you know, something like that. Started up, it started just fine. Ran all the way to the cutoff to get, you know, where I had to cross the median. And I coasted, literally coasted at a dead roll into the shop. And got it. Then I was able to, I was able to call and, and our other son drove and, and picked us up. The Father's provision. You get into a situation that you don't know about, ask the Father, where's your provision, Father? Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. But you ha- it's the word of the Spirit. He, it's the word of his power. Excuse me, it's the word of his power. Okay, all of that. October 1st, 1986. I'm in a village called Laguna de Sanchez outside of Saltillo, Mexico. Took a couple hours to get there. They were literally slaughtering the, the fatted goat when we drove in because they are going to feed us dinner. I shared on Friday, Saturday about the Lord appearing. You, you know my life, that since uh, April of 86, he has appeared to me various times to teach me different things. You can go to our website, cwowi.org, and uh, see all that, and I'll make the same, same invitation that I have each time, and I've been flooded with emails that if you want my book, Pursuing the Seasons of God, which has some of the early visitations with the Lord, you can just email me directly, cwowi at aol.com. Yes, I still use AOL. (laughs) Back in the day, it had child filters on it, and it was convenient for raising two young boys. Enough said on that. So I've just stuck with it, cwowi at aol.com. So... Let's pick it up where, where I am. I, I'm looking down, suddenly I, I hear myself say, it's Jesus, and there he is 15 feet away from me. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm here to meet the needs of the village. Look at that, my pants almost dry. <laughs> and I said, how can I help? You know, I won't be a bother. There's probably sick people here. I'll I'll tag behind. I really won't be a problem. I won't ask any questions. How can I help? And he looked at me and he said, meet the needs of the village. And I shared about how I was pulled into his eyes and all the, asking about all the the injustices of life, how, how my friend who was extremely shallow and claimed to be a Christian versus a woman that I knew in our church who took every bit of grit and, and everything she could as a single mom to raise her two teenagers. And he explained how he looked through the corridors of time when he created each of us, and he gifted us according to our lives and what we would need, remembering that all things work for him and all things were created by him and for him, and for everything to work properly, it has to be in him. And he looked down through the corridors of time, creating us to depend 100% on him. Based on that, he created us and gifted us. That's why there's so many difficulties, because he created us to, to encounter the problems of life in him. And there are many people who encounter the problems of life without him. They don't realize they were created to, and all things were created for him and by him and for him. And so that my shallow friend still had to depend 100% on the Lord and it took everything in him, in his shallowness, to depend on the Lord because that's how he was graced and that's how he was gifted. 
But the other lady who was gritty and, and scrambling for everything she could just to keep her two teenagers in line, she also had to depend on the Lord 100%, but she had the grace, she had the gift to, to go through what she endured in life so that all are equal because each had to depend 100% on him according to their gifting. And he said, I want to teach you how the Father communicates. And then he disappeared. Remember up to that point, I told you that I was in a cloud of glory, that I had looked up to the missionary Carl and Dora, the interpreter, who were walking away, and I said, I said they need to know you're here. And when I went, Carl, I, just like that, this light just, whoosh, just, just erased everything. And all of that that I just said happened within that light. And then suddenly he was gone. And I turned and started to head up the, up the path, up the rocky road closer towards the village. And suddenly I looked up and he was there again. Now understand, when my eyes are open, in the, in, I've been in the spirit, like I said, where everything is gone. It's like in Revelation 1.10, the apostle John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard a voice behind me that sounded like mighty waters, like a trumpet. And I turned and he saw the Lord in glory. And he, in, in Revelation 4, 2, the Apostle John says, I was in the Spirit, and I heard a voice say, come up here, and I looked, and there was a door in heaven saying, come up here, and he was caught up into heaven. For me, it's more like 2 Kings chapter 6, when Elisha, Elisha saw both the enemy chariots and the heavenly chariots around them. My eyes are wide open, but I see both realms. It's like a, an overlay of two universes, two realms, two dimensions. I don't know how to explain it. Even right now, the angels standing around, I see them, I see you. I, it's just an overlay. It's, it's people who see things in the spirit, there's a gift called the discerning of spirits. And that often has, many of the gifts have a, 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 visual, a visual element to them. And sometimes people, when they see things in the spirit, they say, oh, I'm called to be a seer. It's like, no, you're just functioning in the gifts of the spirit. A seer, a true prophet, will have words for a nation like Agabus the prophet did. Uh, on weather and things of that nature and politics and stuff, the way the New Testament prophet Agabus did, as well as a personal word for people. But anyway, so suddenly the Lord was there again, another 15 feet away. And he, said, he made this statement. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's turn to Mark chapter 2. Many, many people say, I wish the Lord would talk to me. I wish I could hear his voice. I wish I could hear his voice clearer, right? All of us. I still say this. I want, I want to know deeper. I want to know more. There's an old Margaret Becker song that's one of my favorite. It's called Deep Calling, deep calling to Deep or Deep Calling Deep. And my deep calling his deep. It's from one of the Psalms. You ever feel like that? I just want more. So he looked at me and he said, I want to teach you how the Father communicates. And he said, made this statement and it's worth writing down if you're keeping notes. And remember I used the King James Version. Okay, in fact, this Bible I've got here, I think I bought it in 1978. So, I mean, it's, I've got, in fact, I've got a backup in case anything ever happens because I know which column, you know, when I'm thumbing through it, you know how it is. It's like an old friend. It's not to the point that if there was a fire in the house, I'd grab it before my wife. It doesn't rise to that level of importance because I know the person of the word. And, and, and so I have all of this in print. I have all of this inside me through the person of the word that I know and who I do value. So no, I'd, I'd grab my wife first. <laughs> but he said this. He said, the Bible uses words, the words perceive, discern and witness to describe the process by which your mind picks up on what is in your spirit. He said the Bible uses words like perceive, discern, and witness to describe the process by which your mind picks up what is in your spirit. He started describing, he said, your mind, oh, all right, where did I have you turn, Mark 2? Shame on me. Better go to Luke 16. But hold your place. I think last night I told you to, uh, 
turn to Luke 16, didn't I? This was a teaching. This thing, this lasted probably 40 minutes, as, as, as best as I remember. When you're in the spirit like that, you really lose track of time. But when he made that statement, and of course, I'm always asking for chapter and verse, you know, when, when he says something that's a little outside of my understanding. And he referred to Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. This is a rich man and, who is unnamed and a beggar man named Lazarus. And the beggar man named Lazarus is laid at the gate of the rich man and the dogs come and lick his sores. And, the, and all, that the, the, all Lazarus wants is to be fed with the crumbs that fall from the, the garbage that's thrown out. Now, you've got to understand, in Hebrew culture, in Jewish culture at that time in the first century, the rich man had an obligation to feed Lazarus. And he did not. Okay? So this was not a righteous man at all. And, it, and, and it's interesting, when the, Lord, when the Lord is teaching me from this, he said, he said some will call this a parable, but these, were, these are real men. That's something I can't verify by chapter and verse other than Jesus said there were two men. So if you take it at face value, it's, he said it. He's not saying this is like a mustard seed. He's just saying there were two men. In the process of time, they each died. Now at that time in the earth, there were two, two places in the earth. You can remember in Ephesians 4, 8, I believe it is, and 9, it says what that he ascended, but what is it that he first also descended into the lower parts of the earth? At that time, there's a place called hell, the place of the dead, that's a holding place for the unrighteous. There was also a place called paradise, Abraham's bosom, or captivity. It goes by all those names in Judaism. If you read Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, I'll pick it up in verse 23. The rich man died, he saw the beggar died. He was, the beggar was in Abraham's bosom and the rich man died in verse 23. In hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes and he saw, he was tormented and he saw Abraham far off and he saw Lazarus in his bosom. That is Abraham's bosom, paradise, captivity, etc. And he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so he can dip the tip of his finger in water. Cool my tongue, I'm tormented because it's so hot. And Abraham's son, remember you in your lifetime received good things. Lazarus, bad things. So now he's comforted and you're not. Besides all this, there is a great gulf fixed, a chasm. And those that would want to go from here to there can't, and those that want to go from there to here can't. And the Lord used this and he said this. Oh, let me, if I finish that thought, you've got to understand. Do you remember Ephesians 4, you know, 8 again and 9, 10? It says that Jesus led captivity captive. Yeah. Okay, this is, that's what happened. At his resurrection, Mary tried to hold on to him, and he says, no, 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 no. He said, I've not yet ascended to my father. Now, later that night, he came back down. He's not talking about the ascension that happened 40 days later. He's talking about that day. He's raised from the dead. He's leading captivity captive. The, the price has been paid. The sins are, have been paid for, and he can take captivity captive. And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 1, I knew a man about 14 years ago who was caught up to paradise. Because paradise, captivity, Abraham's bosom was caught up because the way was made through the blood of Jesus. Many people believe that the park-like area, the grassy park-like area was, is, was paradise. And that's like when I shared what I saw in heaven. They believe that because the Jews believe that, that captivity was a, was a park-like place with grass and, and trees and water. And it was a place of comfort as they awaited the payment for their sin. And Jesus made the way. Mm -mm -mm. But here, as it pertains to this, I understood all that by the, you know, when Jesus appeared to me, I already understood all that. So he didn't go into the, didn't need to go into the detail I just went into. And this was very brief, and I'm sorry, it was such a brief study. But he said this, he said, notice, he says, these two men remembered each other, spoke to one another, saw each other, heard each other. The one needed was in torment because of the flame. He said, and then this is the major statement he made. He said, the root of your physical senses is actually in your spirit. The root of your physical senses is actually in your spirit. 
And that's why I've asked how many have heard angels? How many have smelled the aroma of the Lord? How many have been around death and smelled the stench of death and, and all of that? You're not sensing any of that with your physical senses. That's in your spirit, man, which occupies the same space as your body. And learning how to differentiate between the two is key to walking in the spirit. He explained to me, he said, he said this, he said, your soul is like the middle point of a teeter-totter with your spirit on one end and its senses and your body on the other with its senses. And you have to continually shift your attention back and forth between your physical senses and your spirit senses. He said, you must learn this. It was a command, I took it seriously. And I said, do you have some examples? Mark chapter two is where he said first. This is where we went first. Mark chapter two. If you, if you want to apply yourself to walking with the Father, walking with the Lord, you wanna be sensitive to the word of the Father's power, that Jesus upholds all things by the word of the Father's power. And you're aware the Father's got the power, but Jesus is upholding all things by that power. I wanna know how to walk in that. I wanna know how to, to make sure I'm in the right path where the Father wants to direct his power in my life. I wanna walk with that. I wanna know it. And God the Father is a spirit. So he's gonna communicate in my spirit first. So the Bible uses words like perceive, discern, and witness to describe the process by which your mind picks up on what is your, in your spirit. You know how it goes. Everybody operates in this. It's Monday morning. Oh, no, let's do it. Let's make it more personal. It's Sunday morning. And in your spirit, you're thinking, let me get to church. And in your soul, I love the worship. But your body, let me sleep. Please, you know, I didn't, you didn't take Saturday off. You didn't give me a break. You were busy all Saturday. And I just want to sleep in a little bit. Your spirit, man, let's worship the Lord. You really need to get charged up. It was a busy week. You really need that energy. You, you know you're tired when you go in, but when you come out, you're energized and the Lord touches you and your soul is right here going, do I agree here with my spirit or do I agree with the body? If your soul agrees with your spirit, you will say, body, get out of bed. Put on the coffee, you know, and your body will obey you and you'll drag that sorry body into the shower. You start and you'll force yourself to pray in tongues. You say, okay, now I'm waking up. Now I'm getting going. Okay. Ooh. But if you're sitting there in your soul and your spirit man's going, you really need to recharge and your body says, oh, doesn't this pill? You just, you just flipped it over. It's cold. You know how you love that cold pill. You just go back to sleep, turn off your mind. And if your soul and your body agree, your spirit will sit there and go, yeah. And then in the, it, later in the day, you're gonna feel this emptiness, this kind of grievance, this kind of like, man, I did not get charged up today. I'm going into the, I'm going into the work week and I just feel kind of empty. And the Lord's explaining this to me, this process, because again, Remember how I taught the other day about how the devil is all by himself when he tempts you? Jesus said in John 8, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of himself. He's looking for somebody to agree with. Okay, our, we are a trinity. Where two come together in agreement, that's where the power will be. So your spirit and soul will agree and drag your body out of bed or your soul and your body will agree and your spirit will be grieved and empty and feel like I didn't get fulfilled today. I, I really should have... I missed it this week. Okay, that's the practical things. That's what the Lord's teaching me. It's stuff that we do every day, but I remember I said that revelation is something you always knew, but you never realized. That's what I'm talking about. Everything I'm saying, you, all, you already knew it, but you never realized it until I started talking about it because the Lord started teaching me about these things. He said, he told me this. He said, remember when you walked, now at the time we lived uh, outside of Boulder, Colorado, and in Boulder, there's a mall called the Pearl Street Mall. They closed off the streets and they made a big pedestrian mall. He said, remember when you were at the Pearl Street Mall and you walked into that store 
and it had a funny feeling in your spirit, and you recognized it when you walked in that there was a spirit attached to that store. And it wasn't until you started looking around and you saw the Buddhas and you saw some of the crystals and some of the things that were going on and you perceived the spirit that was there. And, and, and uh, uh, anyway, the spiritual realm has different feelings to it. This is a little rabbit trail here. This is why a person who was sexually abused when they were younger, like say a woman, They know what the spirit of lust is like. So they can meet a man on the street or a man in church or a man at work or a man at wherever, and their spirit will sense that that person, that man has issues with lust. And they will say in their mind, I don't like this guy. If they will think it through, it's because their spirit recognized something that happened to them 20 years ago or 30 years ago. They'll recognize that. You understand what I'm saying? It happens with men or women. We have experience in different areas, and, you can, and that, those, those evil spirits each have a feel, have a, something that in your spirit you pick up on that. I just used one example, but it could, be, it could be addiction. Maybe you grew up in a household of addicts or alcoholics or something of that nature. You know, you grew up in a household of, of alcoholics, let's say, so you can spot an alcoholic half a mile away. They walk past you in the street and you just know in your spirit that person's dealing with alcoholism. Now, here's the thing that the Lord taught me using these examples. He went to Mark chapter two, verse eight. This is where the man is let down through the roof. Now, it's interesting because when the Lord is telling me this, and I, I, I rarely share this, I usually just gloss right over it, but, but this is what honestly happened. He talked about this and uh, being in the house and he said this, he said, and he talked about being in the house and the scribes there and the Pharisees and the leaders and the packed house. And he looked at me and he said, the house was smaller than what you're imagining or than what you're thinking. And he said, that's close. He said, but it had some windows. So I added in windows in my mind. I'm just saying, okay, have some windows and maybe people looking in the windows. And he said, that's close enough. And he said, when the man was let down through the roof and set in front of him, notice verse verse six. There were certain scribes sitting there reasoning in their hearts. They're reasoning in their hearts. They're thinking. They're not saying anything out loud. But in their hearts, they said, who does this man think he is? He's speaking blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God? And verse eight says in the King James, immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit they were reasoning that way, he said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? What Jesus told me is this, and notice it's the word perceive. Remember, perceive is the, is the, describes the process by which your mind picks up what is happening in your spirit. What he told me is this. He said, I did not read their minds. He said, but when I told the man his sins were forgiven, I noticed their body language. I noticed the expressions on their face. And that caused me to look inside, to shift my attention inside, and that's where I perceived what they were thinking. Okay, now here's what happens. Let's talk that al- alcoholic that's walking towards you. You grow up in a household of alcoholics, here comes somebody. Let's, let's just make this person uh, very thin, very world weary, and it catches your attention. You're not reading their mind, you just notice they look like an alcoholic. They walk by you and you just get that feeling in your spirit. It's not a person who's got a disease that they're, that they're thin. It's not that they're anorexic or anything of that nature. It's just they walk by you and you know that's alcoholism. What caught your attention was their body, their appearance, their posture, their gait, their physical appearance. That causes you to look on the inside of you. The example, another example he used besides that store was that, you know, when I walked in that store, Barbara and I together, when we walked in that store, we could feel it just had a different feel in the spirit. And that's when we started looking around for physical clues. Um, It was interesting. uh, Our our son had some physical physical therapists that would come to the house. I talked about the lust thing earlier. And uh, I was in at the office, at the church office at the time when he first came. And he came to the house and Barb said, she said, I, I don't want this therapist here. 
He's got lust problems. What, what gave her a clue was the big collar, the open shirt, buttoned down. He's supposed to do physical therapy on a mentally retarded kid. And he's dressed like he's going out to the club. You know, the gold chain, hairy chest, everything exposed. That was a clue, and Barb picked up on this in the spirit. And I said, I'll come there the next time just to see, because she was feeling not safe. And sure enough, it was wrong spirit, and so I, we called up and we canceled after that. Interesting, huh? The other example the Lord used is a lady that was in a grocery store. You, I know you, it's hard for you to imagine me being 6'6 and being asked to help get down things from a shelf, a tall shelf at Walmart and elsewhere. But it happens from time to time. As hard as it is to believe, it really does happen from time to time. And there was one particular lady and she had like, it was like a little black cloud hovering over her head. She was kind of bent over, older, and she just asked for some help. And I, I got it down for her and I, and I said, bless you. And I was hoping for some sort of a response from her. And she just turned and went away. But I knew, I, what is that feeling? What is that? And it's depression and, and discouragement and hopelessness and loneliness and all of that. And I said, and I, I turned around and I said, Father, I want to say more, but she didn't open the door. And he said, it's okay. He said, you've done for her what I needed you for, what I wanted you to do for her today. And on that day, all things will be revealed and she will see everyone that I've brought across her path. Interesting. That's going to happen with all of us. We're going to have revealed all the, the Father's handiwork in our lives to guide us here and guide us there and this person and that. Remember, remember what I said earlier about Chris and the truck and how taking our cattle? That guy wasn't saved. He wasn't a Christian. Remember I shared earlier, I, I shared when I asked my angel, I said, why does the Father use the unsaved so much to help the saved? That's a perfect example. But I'd already had the answer by that point. But remember what the angel said when I asked him, I said, why, do you, why does the Father use the unsaved so much to, to bless the saved? And he looked at me like I should know better. He said, that they not come empty-handed before the king. That the Father is so gracious to, whether the person gets saved or not, the Father is so gracious to use the unsaved to bless his children so it could go to their credit when they stand before the king and they not come empty-handed. The Lord's good. So in this example, so the Lord started talking in Mark 2.8 and started talking about how, he, how that was the first clue, that to, to be aware of your surroundings, but always check in, in with your spirit. How does this hit me? How does this person strike me? Your mind is at the middle point of the teeter-totter. What's happening in your spirit? The second example is Luke chapter 8 that he went to. <clears throat> Luke chapter 8. You can relate to this, can't you? Yes. We've all been in those situations. We're all pondering different things. You have a worker at the house, you go by, ah, it doesn't feel right. Or it feels right. Or it's comfortable, I have a peace about it. The wisdom from above is pure and peaceful and gentle. The wisdom of this world, according to James chapter three, verses oh, roughly 14 through 16, the wisdom of this world is sense-oriented, sensual and it leads to confusion. And if this, things are not settled, then follow your spirit. Make the choice, and that's part of walking in faith, and that takes some guts sometimes. That takes a little bit of a backbone to say, you know what, I'm just gonna change direction. Thank you for coming, but I think we're gonna go with another company. And you don't have to tell them you just don't feel right. But anyway, you can internalize that. Um, in Luke chapter, Eight. This is the example of Jesus headed towards Jairus' house to raise his daughter from the dead. And along the way, a woman with a hemorrhaging issue, she'd had a condition, a chronic condition for 12 years of hemorrhaging. And so she was probably anemic. She said, it said in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter five, it says she spent all her money. She was only worse. Ceremonial, ceremonially in first century Judaism, she would have been unclean. She couldn't touch another man because she had this hemorrhaging issue. And so it, it's, we'll pick it up in verse 44. Luke 8, 44. She came up from behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And immediately the issue of, of blood was stenched, was dried up. And Jesus said, who touched me? 
And everyone denied. And Peter said, there's everybody with you, Master. Look at everybody. They're all thronging you and pressing against you. What do you mean, who touched me? Jesus said, somebody has touched me for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. That's the King James. I perceive the virtue has gone out of me, that power has gone out of me. What the Lord told me in this visitation is this. He said, notice, my physical senses were all going off. People were pressing against me. There was sound. I was looking at everybody. The smell, the sight of it all, it was all there. And yet I had the presence of mind that when the power went out and healed the woman, I, it caught my attention. He said, you must, again, he reiterated, you must learn this. You must learn how to function in the world and yet shift your attention continually between your physical senses and your spirit, man. The scripture <clears throat> that this relates to is Hebrews 5.14, and I'll just recite it for you, but you can write it down if you're keeping notes. Hebrews 5.14 that says this, strong meat is for those who by reason of use have trained their senses to discern between good and evil. Strong meat, that means the deeper things, is for those who by reason of use, that means trial and error. That means walking it out as a matter of lifestyle. You're at that store, you sense somebody's depressed and the first thing that happens is, oh no, what if I'm wrong? What if they get mad at me? What if they dial 911? You know, what if they call the store manager? You can be diplomatic. You sense that, that cloud of depression around them, you may just say, hey, are you okay? Or you might just strike it up and say, you know, I had something happen and I just got so sad and I got so depressed after, you know, my mom died and, you know, the Lord just walked me through it. Oh, really? You know, you can test the waters to see if the door is open. It may be just for intercession. It may be the reason you're perceiving that and the Father is giving you that. And he wants to direct his power there in the word of his power, the Lord upholding all things. It may be for intercession or you may be able to talk, strike up a conversation. You don't know what part in a person's life you're going to have. The important thing is you perceive it. You perceive it. And then I always take it first and foremost for prayer. That's it. Just first and foremost, if nothing else, I always pray. Father, I lift up that person. Bring them out of that depression. Give them hope. But you perceive it. Any ever, anybody been in that situation? You have friends. You have situations right now. You know how it is. You, somebody can come in and you have an interaction with them and they leave and you say, whoo, I don't know what problem they had, but there's some spirit of strife attached to them this morning. Ever have that reaction? What caused that? I mean, think about the process. Body language, facial expression, but something hit your spirit. Your soul is looking at them, your, your physical senses, but inside it's like, whoo, there, there is a wrong spirit there. They're in strife. They're in, you know... Maybe, Lord, help them with that. Spirit of strife, get off of my friend in the name of Jesus. You know, you, you, you react to that. You perceive something. The first thing you do is you pray or you come alongside that friend and you command that spirit away if it's strife, whatever the case is, to be there. You start walking in that and the Father gets to the point he can trust you with stuff, he'll give you more. You may not even have to say anything to your friend other than maybe it'll come out later that you prayed for him. Or it may be a case in saying, hey, I noticed that you're upset about something. What's going on? You know, based on the degree of intimacy of your friendship and the closeness of your friendship. The third example he went to is in Acts chapter 14. And this one was pretty amazing. In Acts chapter 14, Paul is at Lystra, which if you've ever read the letter to the Galatians, this is in that region, which is a north central Turkey, modern day Turkey. There's a man there who has, was crippled from his mother's womb. All right, so when he came out, his legs were broken, whatever, he's lame from his mother's womb. Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 14 and verse 8. There sat a certain man at Lystra, crippled in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb. He had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, 
and perceiving he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up on your feet, and he leaped and walked. There was no name of Jesus involved. There was no prayer line. What the Lord brought out is this. He said this. He said, Paul was talking to a group of people. But as he talked, this man drew his attention because he perceived something in his spirit. And he pointed out, he said, the Lord said this. He said, notice that he had to steadfastly behold him. He had to stare at him. I said, yeah, what about that? He said, Paul did that because he had to focus. He had to concentrate on him so he could perceive in his spirit that this man had faith. And he said, there are times you're going to have to stay focused on a person or an event or a situation that you've got to stay focused on until you can perceive what is going on spiritually. See, we, we, in our society, it's a drive-by society. Drive through, drive by, drive whatever, microwave, instant everything. And it's, it's different for us to say, okay, here's this issue at work. I want to keep this on the front burner. I'm just going to be praying. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be steadfastly looking at it. I was ministering once to a group in a Bible school, about 225 students. And so I'm ministering, I'm looking around, and one man up in the balcony just draws my attention. I don't know why. It's just I felt led first, and here's how it worked, to be real honest. First, I sensed in that general section. And then I'm, in my mind, I'm going through process of elimination. Okay, normal, 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 normal. Suddenly, there's, it's like more concentration with the Lord. And I look up, and there's that man in the balcony. And it turned out that once I steadfastly beheld him, the next thing I saw was like a shaft of light over him. And then I started getting a word of prophecy for him. That was right on. It was evidently right on for the situation. But had I just continued, just continued, nothing would have happened. But because I was able to talk, and then I started looking like I was just talking to him, steadfastly beholding him. It was a, a situation that was almost the same. I mean, it happened years after this visitation, this teaching, but I can relate to it. Have you ever had a situation with a friend or a relative, and you kind of steadfastly behold them? You steadfastly lock on that. And until you get the mind of the Lord, until you perceive what's going on. When our young son, Chris, could walk with a walker and leg braces, we lived in Colorado, uh, east of Colorado Springs. They have a zoo there called the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. And we had a big old Chevy Suburban. It used to be a ranch vehicle. I mean, that thing could climb a tree. It's, I love that. That's probably one of my favorite. Next to my, next to my 1965 GTO, which was my first car, which I wish I still had. That Suburban was, was my favorite. I mean, yeah. So we wanted to load up the kids and head to Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. So it's an hour into like near Pueblo and south of Colorado Springs and then, then on into the zoo. It's a day off. We need to get out of Dodge. And so I'm praying about it. I notice as I'm thinking about it, there's something in my spirit that just, there's just a little catch. There's something there that's not quite right. So I start breaking it down in my mind. I start breaking down the trip. Okay, we've got to, we'll, we'll drive Highway 50 into Pueblo. So there's antelope. There's all possibilities. I, nothing bears witness. I'm praying in the tongues. Okay, is the, the truck okay? Is the car okay? Yeah, there's nothing mechanical there. It's okay. It's, I, I, I'm picturing us driving north now on I-25. We're getting off to go to the Shannon Mountain Zoo. Okay, there's not accident. There's nothing in my spirit that comes up. You see, I'm going through this in my mind. This is how I, I, I do this. And so, okay, it's like, okay, I think the truck is fine. The car's, I mean, the car's fine. We're fine from that standpoint. No accidents or anything. So I go to individually. Is there anything with me? Is there anything physical? No, there's nothing. I just draw a blank. So I'm praying in spirit. How about Barb? No, nothing there. I just briefly scan the boys and on Chris, there's just like my attention. I, it stopped right there. There's something with Chris. Okay, Father. Show me more. What's next? So I see Chris, and suddenly this little mini picture with my eyes closed, I see this mini vision. And Chris is on this walker. It's a, it's a backwards walker. It's one you, that the, the body of the walker is behind you, and it's open in front. And he had leg braces called AFOs on his feet, and he could walk, he could run like, he could really run. He's like, uh, how old would he have been? So he was born in 79. This was 90, so he would have been oh, 10 years old or something maybe eight, nine, and he, but I saw this picture of him on his walker, and he was outside, 
And suddenly there was a clap of thunder and Chris got hit by lightning and killed. So I said, in the name of Jesus, I forbid Chris from getting hit by lightning. Satan, you're not going to take out my son. And Father, I ask for your angels to be there to protect him, and I ask for an awareness. Because everything else I get in the trip is the trip is okay to go, except for this, so I ask for your protector, and we're going to go ahead and go. That's how we live. So we went. <clears throat> sure enough, I mean, we fed the giraffe. We did all the things. I'm in the monkey house. We're all in the monkey house. Barb and I are in the monkey house with the two other boys. She thinks I've got Chris. I think she's got Chris. I hear a clap of thunder. Cheyenne Mountain, is, or Cheyenne Mountain Zoo is right up next to the mountains. And in Colorado, those thunderstorms come over the mountains just really quick. And, and unless you're further out, you don't see them developing. And we were right up, nestled right up next to the, the mountains. Hear a clap of thunder. You have Chris? I thought you had Chris. I look out and I see Chris outside because the, the building was long. I see Chris outside on his walker. It is hailing and raining and he is laughing. He loves it. And, he's, and I run out know, knowing what's going to happen but having taken authority over it. I go, I run and I, I swoop in like a, like a daddy eagle picking a trout out of the stream, out of the stream. I swoop in with my right hand, I am running, and I swoop him up, and he's got his walker, and it's like a, like a ride at the, at the fair, or something like that, because that thing got, goes out like this, and goes, he's going, no, 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 and he's still running in the air. <laughs> and he's mad at me. I said, Chris, it's raining, it's hailing, you have to come in. We go inside, about 30 seconds later, pew, lightning hit right where he was. But what did I do? I perceived something in my spirit. We took the trip. We had a wonderful time. The rest of the trip was wonderful. Chris was able to run around the monkey house, and he quickly got over it, and then the thunderstorm passed, and we had a wonderful trip. But that's the way you work. That's the way these things work. So when the Lord taught me this, you, and here's the point, I had to steadfastly think on this. I got something in my spirit, and I wasn't going to let it go until I, because my family, I wasn't going to let it go until, until I had the answer. So, when the Lord said this, he said, when you give a prophecy, do you do it with your eyes open or closed? How do you do it? I said, well, I, I close my eyes. He said, why do you do that? I said, well, really to shut out my physical senses so I can focus on what's in my spirit. He said, exactly. And then he disappeared. <laughs> and I thought, huh. And I'm thinking all these things. And I take a few steps forward, and suddenly I look up and I perceive that his presence is to my right, and it's like man-shaped, like oblong a little bit. It's denser. There's a denser feeling. There's a denser presence of the Lord in this one area. I'm looking all, all around the village and where I am up there, and I see the hills and everything. But right in front of me and just to the right of the path of the little road, there's a denser presence of the Lord. And I give myself to that, and I look at that steadfastly, and suddenly, whoosh, he's there. He comes out of that vagueness, and he's there. And he starts teaching me, and I'm going to shorten this for, for time's sake, but he says this. He says, you can be in a service or in your personal prayer time, and often my people will sense a presence, my presence in that room. And he says, an angel feels like a person who's anointed by the Spirit, and they can feel a more dense, more concentrated uh, presence in that, in that location. Interesting, huh? And he started teaching me this. He said, you need to be sensitive to the mood of the Father and where I'm moving. He said, when you're in a meeting... Be sensitive to what's happening. Switch to your spirit man's senses. And he, like I said, shortening this, he disappeared again and he did it again, two or three times up the path. A little bit more, a little different angle on each time. That's why I tell people, I can't, I can't, I can't make Jesus appear to anybody. I, I can't do that, but I can teach you to be sensitive. And so <clears throat> I shared when I was 14 years old, and I heard a voice behind me saying, go ahead and put on your helmet. 
You know, I was about to get on my mini bike. Go ahead and put on, obey your mom and put on your helmet. And I knew that was my angel. An angel feels like a person anointed by the Spirit, like there's another person in there, but it's not quite a person. But you can feel the presence of the Lord. Has anybody here ever been in a situation where you felt like there was an angel in the room? Have you ever been at home in a hospital room or whatever? You just felt the presence of the Lord. But if you will train yourself in this, in your spirit man's senses, you can sense where there's a denser. You may not see them, but you can sense where they're standing. Because the concentration, the presence of the Lord will be more focused. It feels more dense, weightier, more concentrated in, in that area. Interesting. Interesting. An angel, without getting in, just cutting it real short, angels are always on the outside. They can't read your mind. They're servants of the Lord. But every example in Scripture, they look like a man, and they are always on the outside. The Holy Spirit is on the inside. That's the big difference. And and in my experience, a lot of people, when people say, I heard the audible voice of the Lord, what they're really saying is, what they don't understand because of inexperience or just it blew them away, just such an experience, is the Holy Spirit, when he speaks, it is very clear, concise, and to the point, and it sounds like a loud speaker in your brain, and many people will mistake it and say, I heard the audible voice of God. What you really heard was just the Holy Spirit for the first time in your life. And I'm I'm telling you, the Lord moved... You remember how I shared about the, no, I don't know that I shared, I better not start it. The Lord moves from the vague to the specific. I'll put it that way. The Lord often moves from the vague to the specific. Remember on Friday night I talked about how the Lord moves from darkness to light. No, didn't I? No, I didn't, did I? Okay. <laughs> the Lord moves from darkness to light. He moves from disorder to order. And so, therefore, he will move from the vague to the specific. Paul had to steadfastly behold the man to perceive he had faith because he had a vague feeling, and the longer he, he steadfastly looked at the man, the more specific the information became. That's the ways of the Spirit. That's how we train ourselves, to focus on the things of the Spirit. Sometimes you have to give yourself to them. And that's why I say oftentimes, like, like Barbels, if she senses an angel, she can sense a denser area, denser area, and it's like that's her angel. And once in a while, if you focus on that, then the Lord will open up your eyes. And that's a function of the discerning of spirits, the, being able to see things in the spirit realm. So much. Oh, let me tell you the rest of that story. The Lord, the Lord started walking with me. And again, my eyes are wide open. He's like 5'11". We're walking side by side. And I think in myself, you're taller than the king of the universe. And he smiled. And then I said, dummy, he knows exactly what you're, he knows what you're thinking. And we were just in front of the door where Carl and Dora had disappeared into this house. And I, I, didn't, I had not paid attention. I was in the spirit. I didn't know. But the Lord stopped, put out his hand and said, this is it. And I went in there. So we ate our meal. And after our meal, Carl is sitting with his back to the wall. The door into the house is right behind me. I'm just inside and it's right behind me to my right. And Dora is at the end of the table and there's a, a doorway into, the, into the, what was the bedroom area of the house. And she's, sitting, and she's just sitting there. She's only known the Lord a couple, couple months. And suddenly I see an angel standing behind her. And I said, Dora, do you sense anything? She said, no. I said, pray in the spirit and just close your eyes and sense. And I said, what you need to do is just sense for if there's, you've sensed the presence of the Lord, is it more concentrated in one area of the room or not? I said, okay, I can, I can do that. So she closed her eyes. And it's like she's scanning with radar. She's just praying in the Spirit. And then after a few seconds, she says, I feel like the presence of the Lord is like there's somebody standing behind me. Now notice what she had to do. She had to shut her eyes to close out some of the physical senses so she could concentrate on her spirit. 
And I said, you're right, that's, a, that's an angel, you got it. And with that, the angel went around her and out behind me. And I'm drinking the soft drink. And I hear this voice by my right ear saying, Jesus is walking the streets of the village. And I finished my drink. <laughs> Dora, quick! And I, well, I turned around and I saw just as the angel just, the, the last part of his leg as he headed up the street, you know, out the doorway. I said, Dora, come here, quick. So Dora comes out. And it is, it is literally about from here to the pulpit, you know, the 50 feet or something from the front of the church to the back. She comes out and I look at the Lord. The Lord is standing there. The, and to our way of thinking, our uh, situation, the, where the Lord is standing, the road goes to the right at 90 degrees, and it also goes to the left at about 45 degrees. To the right is more into the village. To the left is kind of up to like a, a few houses, but it was basically a dead end. And there's an angel standing there at the Y, and the Lord is standing right at the intersection. And I looked to the Lord, and he said this. He said, I want you to teach Dora what I just taught you. That was revolutionary for me because it meant I didn't have to keep it quiet. It meant that I could teach others. It said volumes. So I said, Dora, I want you to close your eyes and I want to see if you, you sense the presence of the Lord or anything you know, like that. So she closed her eyes. She's, she's looking ahead. She says, okay, uh, the presence of the Lord is really strong straight ahead. And then off to our left, there's a presence of the Lord, but it's not as strong. Maybe it's an angel or something. I said, very good, very good. And so we started walking up closer and closer. And she got to literally, like I shared the other night, she got to literally within five feet of Jesus. And she goes, it's Jesus. And he goes, ha <laughs> ha, like that, and slaps his knees and starts walking. He goes, he's just chuckling to himself. And she goes, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. And so... That was the night that we saw the angels in front of the van and protected us and everything else. But that teaching, I've greatly condensed here, but that teaching changed my life. There's no other way to say it. I began living a life where I would pray in the Spirit, most often not turn on the radio or any playlist. Now, there's exceptions, like when Chris is in the car, you know, it's Donut Man and Veggie tales and stuff like that. But if I'm driving by myself, like tonight I'll get in around midnight and drive home. It's about 90 minutes. I'll get home around 2 a.m. And I'll be praying in the spirit the whole time. Just because I enjoy the fellowship. I enjoy that feeling in my spirit. I might put on some oldies or something where I can pray in the spirit. I may put on my worship track. I've got a, I've got a um, um, instrumental worship. I may do that. Instrumental. I've got, a, I've got some oldies, second chapter of Acts and... Margaret Becker and, you know, Keith Green and stuff like that. I, I don't know. I'll follow what, what feels right in my spirit. Uh, it's not a Keith Green night. No. You know, uh, second chapter of Acts, just not quite there. I just need, I think I'm just going to put on some instrumental worship and I'll pray in the spirit and just drive. I follow my spirit. And when I get in a situation, I, I pick up Chris on Friday mornings and say, Father, what order of events? And oftentimes I'll know where Chris is going to want to go to have lunch. So I'll know how to time things. You know, I pick up Chris from the group home on Fridays, return him on Saturdays. So you go through life figuring out your schedule. There are many times, many times I was, when I was on staff at the church, like I remember one time in particular, I knew there was a two o'clock meeting. And when I got up that morning, there was something mm, heavy about that two o'clock meeting. So you know what I did? I did what Paul did here in Acts 14. I steadfastly gave myself to it. I focused on that. Father, I'm lifting up that two o'clock meeting. What is there? Why is there something in my spirit about it? And the more I gave myself to it, the more I realized there was a spirit of strife. And one of the guys, and I saw his face who would be in that meeting, was going to push his own agenda, and it wasn't the Lord's will. And so I prayed about that, and I took authority over the spirits of strife and, and the jealousy and some of the things that motivated him. And you know what? And that meeting came up. He started to speak up, and then somebody shut him down, and it went in another direction. And I went, thank you, Lord because I prayed for that before. That's how you walk through life. That's how you walk in the spirit. Jesus upholds all things by the word of the Father's power. The Father's got the power. You need to walk with the word, the living word, the person of Jesus, to say, how are we doing this today? And the Father's power will be directed right there because you want the Holy Spirit to wash that car. And you want, if he's, if he's at the front end of that car, you want to be at the front end. You don't want to be working on the taillights. You know what I'm saying? So it's teamwork. 
the Father through his spirit to the body of Christ, which is in our spirit and then out our soul and out to our body. So remember the lesson. The next time you're laying in bed on a Sunday morning or a Monday morning, your spirit and soul are in agreement. Yes, I will get my body out of bed. And there are times to listen to your body. There are definitely times to listen to your body. Your body says, I've got to have some sleep. I've got to have some rest. I've got to have a day off. You say, you're right, body, you do. I'm going to, I'm, I'll just spend some time in worship. I'll have some worship time just to charge myself up. I'll tune in online. There's times to listen to the body. So anyway, whew, hope this has been a blessing. Yeah. <laughs>